medical advances are an important part of a modern society. The breakthroughs that make advancement possible come through the collaborative and organizational efforts of medical pioneers. Such is the story of the American Association of Electrodiagnostic Medicine, now celebrating 50 years of promoting excellence in electrodiagnostic techniques. The stage was set for the development of electrodiagnostic medicine early in the 20th century. Inventions such as the string galvanometer, cathode ray tube, amplifiers, and bipolar needle electrodes rapidly advanced the field. During the 1940s, doctors James Golseth, Herbert Jasper, and James Fazell began creating the first EMG instruments. Clinical use of EMG, however, was not widespread because the equipment was custom-built, expensive, and difficult to find. The large number of peripheral nerve injuries during World War II made the need for more research very clear, but there seemed to be an unwillingness to embrace this new technology. In 1948, Dr. Golseth developed the prototype of the first EMG machine commercially available for clinical use. In the summer of 1951, Dr. James Golseth wrote a letter inviting physicians to attend a meeting to discuss plans to start this new organization. Twenty-three physicians replied that they were interested in attending. Dr. Ernest Mack, who would later become the ninth president of the organization, responded, Dear Jim, I am very interested in such an organization as there is no such get-together at the present time. This planning group met at the Shirley Savoy Hotel in Denver, Colorado. Over the next year, Dr. Golseth continued planning. Dr. Thomas Oster, who would become the second president of the organization, wrote to Dr. Golseth in May of 1953. In regard to the name, I also think that both electromyography and electrodiagnosis should be included, and offhand think that the American Association would be the best bet. In August of 1953, Dr. Golseth again invited physicians to attend a formal organizational meeting at the Palmer House in Chicago, Illinois, for the American Association of Electromyography and Electrodiagnosis. Founding member Dr. William LaJoy wrote back to Dr. Golseth. It is very gratifying to hear that you are planning an American Association of Electromyography and Electrodiagnosis. I have found the electromyogram to be an invaluable diagnostic aid. The 21 physicians in attendance at the meeting adopted a constitution, elected officers and a council, and planned for the future of the organization. The American Association of Electromyography and Electrodiagnosis, or the AAEE, was born. One of the important decisions made at that first meeting was that, for purposes of electromyography, a positive deflection would be represented by an upward deflection on the cathode ray oscilloscope, a controversial position that is still debated today. Members were charged a $15 joining fee, and dues were set at $10 per year. Ninety physicians attended the first scientific meeting in Washington, D.C. In 1959, the AAEE was officially incorporated in Rochester, Minnesota, thanks to the work of another founding member, Dr. Edward Lambert. During the 1950s and 1960s, the AAEE began to slowly grow. The original process of joining was extremely cumbersome. According to an early newsletter of the organization, only a moderate number of qualifying applicants were elected, and the membership committee made sure that those who applied were actually engaged in electromyography or electrodiagnosis, and those who had only a casual interest were eliminated. By the end of 1969, the AAEE had 152 members. Carpal tunnel syndrome, although not called that yet, was also on the minds of electromyographers in the 1960s. 
In the 1961 newsletter, 4th AAEE President Arthur A. Rodriguez cautioned elbow benders of the danger involved in TV viewing. He stated that such posture can cause a pressure type injury to the nerve around the elbow and cause numbness in the hands and arms and even paralysis. Also in the 1960s, the AAEE board began discussions regarding development of an examination to prove competency in EMG. A committee was established, and by 1969, Dr. Ernest Johnson reported that the exam was ready to be used. Active membership was reserved for those who passed this examination. This test was the predecessor to the American Board of Electrodiagnostic Medicine certification that would be established in 1987. Throughout the 60s and 70s, the association concentrated on how to run the organization and created the rules that would govern membership. In 1970, the AAEE board realized that it had grown large enough to have a home office and an executive secretary. Rochester, Minnesota was chosen as the home office site and Ella Van Lanningham became the executive secretary. Prior to Ella, Gazella Wiederholt handled the executive secretary responsibilities of the AAEE. Ella would retire in 1995, and Sherlyn Adkins would become the new executive director. In 1976, the first annual Edward H. Lambert Lecture was established to honor Dr. Lambert. The training program self-assessment examination, which is still given today, was created in 1977. It was also in the 70s that the AAEE became accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education and, in 1978, the first CME courses were offered. Early EMG equipment was large and not very attractive by today's standards. Those machines were simply oscilloscopes with amplifiers. They grew larger as new features like averagers, additional channels, and signal processing were added. Later, in the 1980s, with the introduction of microprocessors, the components would become smaller. By 1984, modern-looking computers would be added to the EMG systems to perform the ancillary processing, and, within a decade, the instruments would become the design we see today. The annual meeting changed throughout the 1970s and 1980s. In the late 70s and early 80s, special interest groups, workshops, and the Videotape Learning Center were added. Dinner seminars would be added in 1991. All of these have become staples of the meeting through the present time. Membership continued to grow slowly during this period. By the end of 1979, the AAEE had 712 members. As the association grew, it became clear that it needed an official journal. 28th President Ian McLean wrote in the newsletter, The only other item for discussion that I foresee at this time as having potential for stirring the blood of our members is selection of the official AAEE journal. So, in 1982, under the chairmanship of Dr. Walter Stolov, the AAEE signed an agreement with John Wiley & Sons to make Muscle & Nerve the official journal of the association the following year. Walter G. Bradley was the editor of the journal at that time. To further provide legitimacy to the organization, in the late 1980s, the AAEE submitted an application to the American Medical Association to have a seat in the House of Delegates. The application was accepted, and Dr. Thomas Swift and Dr. Ian McLean became the first delegates. In 1988, Dr. Jun Kimura became the editor of Muscle & Nerve. Jun wrote in his first editorial, this is a kickoff of a new era of muscle and nerve, which now comes in 12 rather than 9 issues per year. Any fool can kick a ball, but the question is how far and, more importantly, in what direction. He would later be succeeded by Dr. Michael Amanoff in 1998. At the 1989 annual meeting, the membership voted to change the name of the organization to the American Association of Electrodiagnostic Medicine. By the end of 1989, membership in the AAEM had skyrocketed to 2,237. 
with continued emphasis on a high-quality annual meeting as well as educational products, AAEM membership would continue to grow and, only 10 years later, at the end of 1999, there would be 4,358 members. Throughout the 1990s, the AAEM improved its communication with the membership by adding the newsletter Positive Waves and in creating the AAEM website. The first email ever sent by AAEM office staff was to the association's president, Les Dorfman, in 1994. The association also increased its focus on research by creating the AAEM Foundation for Research and Education in 1995. In 2000, a practice-oriented newsletter called Practice Topics was developed and the AAEM continued to emphasize the importance of advocacy. Still, it wasn't all about work. AAEM members have also had a lot of fun. And in some cases, AAEM members combined fun with accomplishments that were out of this world. The AAEM has shown remarkable resilience and vitality over the past half century. Due to the leadership of past presidents and board members, the association has become the premier organization for physicians who diagnose and treat patients with disorders of muscle and nerve. The AAEM has been the driving force in expanding knowledge in the frontiers of electrodiagnostic medicine and in improving the quality of patient care. The American Association of Electrodiagnostic Medicine is well positioned to continue its leadership role for the next 50 years. <laughs>